now your hosts for Clean Radio, Andrew and Judah. Good evening. Welcome to Clean Radio, our show that explores addiction treatment and recovery. My name's Andrew, and I'm here with my co-host, Judah. Hey, now. Good evening, Judah. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Uh, tonight, we'll be taking calls, as well as having um, several very key and exciting guests. Uh, if Judah can remember the number. It's 877-8-830-830. That's impressive. 877-8-830-830. And where can people hear us online? They can hear us online uh, at the KLAA website. Or AM830.net. AM AM830.net. AM That's we're, correct. We're getting this. We're getting good. We're getting better. I know. My mother complimented us again this week. <laughs> Is, I, we're going to open every week with your mother's comments? <laughs> she actually complimented you more than she did me. Well, Sorry. Yes, I know. Is it, how's that for your self-esteem? It's not very good. No. It's getting worse and worse. Wow. Okay. So you're not going to ask me why I'm all dressed up, or should I? Well, it's radio, so. Well, people could see the show on. Online, that's online. true. Yeah, so Judah, why are you all dressed up? Well, now that you ask, I, uh, <laughs> I was actually at a, at a very fun Oscar party. It was uh, called The Night of 100 Stars, uh -huh. and I got to meet a childhood hero of mine, Ernest Borgnine. Wow. And uh, while everybody was probably talking to him about Oscar-winning films, I was talking to him about Airwolf, a favorite show of mine in the 80s with the helicopter. So, yeah, that's my... And he didn't just die of boredom right there? No, he actually sat, sat me down. He took a picture with me, and uh, uh -huh. I sat down on a piano stool with him. It was pretty cool. I mean, like, you don't get to, you know, that's Ernest Borgnine. Okay. Just got a Lifetime Achievement Award, so... Great. Yeah, I know. Exciting. Very exciting. Anyway, tonight we've got a very exciting show. I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, the, later in the show, we have a group called Laughs Without Liquor coming in. And that's your wife. One she of actually is one of the comedians. Her name's Amy Dresner, the notorious Amy Dresner. That's a <laughs> <laughs> then we have Ian Harvey, who's another great comic, as well as Fallon O'Reilly. Very exciting. So they're going to be joining us later tonight for some exciting little tidbits of comedy. And talking about their tour, they're going on a national tour. Oh, very cool! Are you yeah. going to be going? No, I have to work. I have. Are you going to trust your wife on the road by herself? It's really not much. And, and I don't mean not to cheat. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> no, she's trustworthy, and you know, she, you know, most people are kind of intimidated by her. So I don't. I'm intimidated by yeah, her. Yeah. Right. When I, you know, I met her before you. She used to drive around in a purple, a purple. What was it? What was it? That uh, car, that uh, PT Cruiser. The PT Cruiser. Yeah. yeah, that was before I knew her. That was before you knew her. Yeah, I did hear about those days though. She used to drive around with her cat in the car. Yeah, that big purple. Yeah. She definitely had a drug problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, speaking of which, I was, I was, um, I was, uh, I think as everybody was, just transfixed by uh, Mr. Sheen this week. He does seem to be the hot topic of addiction uh, I, this week. And, uh, you know, and I, I was talking to you on the phone today. I was, like, curious, is it mental illness or is it drug addiction? You know, I, I think there's a, there isn't really much of a line. Um, I think drug addiction is a form of mental illness. But more specifically to your question, um, clearly there does appear to be uh, some issues with him that are deeper than just the misuse of substances. What do you think comes first, though? That's my... You know, I was, this is true. I mean, I, years ago I was in rehab with this priest and he had wet brain, you know, so, I mean, mm -hmm. basically what that is is when your brain gets soaked up and... Dementia. Dementia, right. So he was in this rehab and he thought he was, his name was Father Frank. Right. And he was in this rehab for 27 years. Right. And, but he thought he was there for a week, you know, so, I mean, has his brain just gone because of all the drugs he's done or was he self-treating his brain with all the drugs because of his... Well, that sounds like late stage alcoholism and that's characterized often by uh, dementia, drug-induced dementia. Um, but he could also be secondary to just a natural Alzheimer's or... No, but I'm talking about Charlie Sheen now. Oh, you're talking about Charlie yeah, Sheen, not, like, not your priest. Not my priest, who everybody would actually do their f their fifth step with. I thought you were Jewish. I don't understand the priest bit. Well, he was in rehab with us. Oh, I, I mean, it, my right. parent, they got I got sent to a rehab in upstate New York, and uh, I'll never forget this night, actually. My parents are driving me up at 2 in the morning, <laughs> and they get to this rehab, and they're like crosses all over the windows. <laughs> and my father looks at my mother, and I'll never forget their face. They were like, okay, what are we going to do? He's got to get help. Right. And, like, you know, they were willing to do whatever it took for me to, even if it meant, like, their thought of, like, 
you know, signing their boy over to the other side, you know, to get help. Is, they really, were, is it really the other side? Well, well for an Orthodox Jewish family, you know. It's to, Old Testament than the New Testament. Yeah, it's a little different. It's like the prequel. It's, it, is, <laughs> it, is, it is the prequel, but, uh, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, it was very scary for them, but... Again, you know, it's like you hear these these, these rants and, uh, you know, going back to Charlie Sheen, and it's almost like it's like you're listening to somebody that's, lo- you know, just, you know, that's it. They're, they're past the point of no return. You know, I, I, I don't know Charlie personally, and I uh, don't know whether he's u- actively using, you know, we hear a lot of reports in the media that he is. Um, I did hear the rant. I heard it uh, on the Internet after it happened. Um, you know, and there sounds like a lot of anger and a lot of paranoia and compressed speech and signs of someone who might be using you know, an amphetamine of some type. But um, also there's sounded like a little bit of grandiosity and paranoia. And those things tend to be secondary to substance abuse too, long term chronic, especially cocaine abuse, which seems to be what people in the media are saying is the case with Charlie Sheen. You seem a little tired tonight. I'm a little tired. I've been working really hard. I've been up all uh, day. I've been working with clients. You have a real job. Uh, yeah, working at uh, the treatment center. Does it get to you? No, I actually enjoy it. I find it refreshing. You know, it's uh, it's good to get up every day and work with clients and their families and, um, you know, uh, work with difficult issues. I actually really enjoy it. So. I mean, would, I mean, it's it's a hard it's it's a hard business you've chosen. What what is harder? Because you've done the mental illness facilities and you've done drug treatment facilities. Right. I started in acute care psychiatric hospitals. Um, you know, uh, I think psychiatric hospitals are different in that it's more brief treatment oriented. Uh, with the way that insurance has panned out over the last twenty years, most people can't stay in a psychiatric hospital for more than fourteen, fifteen days. Um, it used to be that the minimum length of stay in a psychiatric hospital was 30 days, during which time you do an evaluation of a, a client. To, the, to decide if they need more? Yeah, you just find a baseline, try and figure out what's going on, and often that took 30 days just to figure out what was going on in terms of medication and observe their behavior and talk to them and you know, see if it was environmental from where they were, if it was a substance that they were using, or if there was some sort of real organic psychiatric problem. But with the cuts in uh, health insurance and the way that things are structured now, most people uh, that go into a psychiatric hospital only stay for a very short period of time. So if someone overdoses on medication or they have really severe depression, the average length of stay is extremely short, and then they use psychopharmacology to stabilize the client very quickly and then move them to an outpatient setting. So that's why I moved really out of the psychiatric business and more towards substance abuse because we have much longer lengths of stay. Our average client comes and stays with us for you know one to four months, and that's not because of insurance. That's just because they well, realize we're, the we're, need for treatment. Well, we're largely private pay as well, right. so we're operating outside of the realms of insurance and you know people dictating what should and shouldn't be treatment. Um, one of the benefits of providing private pay insur- uh, treatment is that you get to actually create real treatment programs. Now, treatment is, you know, I mean, it is a little expensive, obviously. So, but, you know, comparatively, it's really not, it's not as expensive as, you know, for what you're getting. It's not, you know, that expensive. For the longer, it's funny, you know, you could use drugs and you could drink and you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Somebody says, get help for 40 grand. It's like, oh, my God, that's a little too much money. Yeah, I mean, if you compare actually behavioral health treatment uh, in the United States to other types of medical problems, it's a, it's almost an inconsequential expense um, to taxpayers and to insurance companies. But there's a, what they call a large elasticity of demand, meaning that if people are given the availability of treatment and it's paid for, there's a lot of people out there that need help. And so the system quickly gets flooded. So it's very hard for governments to provide funding for treatment programs because there's just so much demand. Now you also offer, you have, you know, I remember talking to you about this, that you have a few beds that you give away in case people can't afford it. Yeah, we give away 10% of our beds at all the t- all the time. Which is so. pretty, which is really cool. And I, yeah. like I said last week, I checked out the place and it's absolutely, and it's amazing. It's in the middle of West Hollywood and I don't work for Andrew. I have no horse in the race, you know, and we're just friends. And you know, I was there, and it's really. I mean, I would. I was going to ask you if I could stay. You know, I was. I didn't have an apartment last week, and I was like, you know, this isn't bad. 
Right, if we weren't full, that might have been a, that, that, that would have been, been that would, like I thought maybe make it executive suites, even though I'm not an executive, and right. uh, you know just get my groundwork and so I could report better. No, it's uh, it was really interesting um, that we actually got the space that we did. They were formerly corporate units, um, townhouses, and uh, we converted them into this very cool sort of hip space. And that's a lot about what we're about. We're about sort of cutting edge treatment, um, and I think we try to have that same sort of uh, ideology and ideas go through everything we do. So the design and the furnishing and the landscaping is all sort of state, you know, state of what's current in the art movement. And we like to track people into treatment based on the idea that we're doing things in kind of a hip and cool way. No, I think so. it's like, but it's, you know, it's one of those things that it's like these days, you know, there's so many different, you know, sides to things. It's like, you know, that rehab costs too much. That, you know, there's this like, there's this trend towards, you know, like I said, you know, oh, 40 grand is too much. Or, you know, not thinking of the, you know, I, and I'm not saying that's how, I don't know your prices, but, you know, saying, you know, th what is the price of a good life? Right. You know, and I don't think people are always looking at that when they're thinking about, you know, treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah, you know, the 12 steps are free and everybody could go. So what are the benefits of going away for 30 days and spending 50 grand? Well, there's a big difference between 12-step programs and then treatment centers. Right. Um, although a lot of treatment centers focus largely on the 12 steps, um, there's other treatment centers like ours that focus more on dual diagnosis um, and more of a social component mixed with an, uh, an affiliated medical model. So we work hand in hand with affiliated uh, doctors and psychiatrists. And, and having come from a mental health background that dealt largely with psychiatry, I'm interested in what underlying psychiatric conditions might exist as well as an addiction. So while we primarily treat addiction, um, underlying there, we often find there's a lot of psychiatric illness. You know, because when I used to go to rehab and they used to, <laughs> they used to ask me the psychological questions, but I always felt like it wasn't from a psychiatrist. Right. You know, it was like sort of like they had these standardized, you know, like, do you feel, a, you know, are you depressed? Are you happy? I was like, I don't know. I drink, you know, and I always felt like I wanted to be <laughs> I wanted them to say, well, you're you know, you're you know, you're mentally ill. Come, you know, and we'll give you three hots and a cough for the rest of your life and meds, you know, and they, they would always just say to me, well, you just have alcoholism. And I was always like, damn. You know, because the thought, because, you know, when you're an alcoholic, it's so funny. It's like, you know, the treatment isn't so bad for alcoholism and addiction. It's like you ask anybody else with any other disease, they'd kill for our treatment. The interesting thing with addiction is that it's characterized primarily by denial. Um, you know, most people that are addicts, even if they temporarily realize they have a problem with addiction, they're, they're in denial that they really want to get help or that they uh, need help. They're very the solution they've come up with with their life is to use. It often starts working when they start using a substance or drink alcohol, um, and then over time it doesn't work anymore, and then they end up in a situation where they're isolated and depressed and sometimes suicidal. And uh, that's normally when we first see people, once it's already gotten to that point. Um, it's rare that we see people that recognize early on that they're developing a problem with a substance abuse um, and get treatment early. Unfortunately, and the number here is eight seven seven eight eight thirty eight thirty. That's eight seven seven eight eight thirty eight thirty. And the reason I started, thank you. And the reason I was <laughs> laughing about that was my eight. mother was commenting on that today too. She's like, "Oh, you got the number right." And I she's like, "That's I know." She's like, "That took you a few weeks." And I was like, and I was thinking about that in my head as I was thinking about my mother and your mother because your mother commented <laughs> on how badly I said the number too.